Good morning and welcome to the School's Climate Summit, held as part of London Climate Action Week 2021. We're delighted to have you join us at this inaugural summit to transform the role of schools and the education sector in addressing the climate crisis. And in particular, in meeting our city's net zero and circular economy targets and the global goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. My name is Marlene Imhera and I'm co-chair of the London Climate Action Week Education Group, along with my colleague, Martin Crabb. I am Martin Crabb and I'm a teacher, a geography teacher at Glebe School, and I'm the co-chair with Marlene on the London Climate Action Week Education Group. In, in this short introduction, Martin and I will provide an overview of the summit and what you can expect during the day. The summit is a unique attempt to bring together and leverage the diverse sections of the school community, school leaders, governors, business managers, staff, students, parents and carers for collective climate action. It's also a unique attempt to bring together the diverse types of schools we have in London, state schools, private schools, academies, special schools, faith schools, <laughs> alternative education and PIUs, because no child should be left behind. Our objective is to bring systems thinking at the individual school level and a sectoral approach, leveraging the size and scale that a city like London offers. This is why our summit motto is think like a system, act as a sector. We want to make impact at scale, and this is why we want to engage each of London's three and a half thousand schools in this mission. The summit focuses on five major themes that cut across the school as an institution. As a shorthand, we call them the four C's and the one F. They stand for campus, curriculum, community, careers, and finance. And you'll see these themes reflected in the design of today's program. Today's summit is just one part of a broader series of events that we have designed throughout the week. These consist of today's marathon day-long conference program, but also schools-based activities and deep dives, the expert-led teachings and workshops exploring further all of the five summit themes. We'll also have a pop musical and a student MP climate surgery at the end of the week. For example, as part of our, my own school's based activity, my school is hosting a very special banquet today in our wild area. And you'll be hearing more about Glebe School and the banquet at the introduction to the campus session at 10.30 this morning. I actually lost my reading glasses down in the wild area setting it up this morning, so I've borrowed some. And we're delighted that so many partner schools will be showcasing their work today, from Martin School Glebe to JCOS, the Jewish Community School, our Lighthouse School for the faith school sector, uh, City of London Academy, COLA for the academy sector, you'll hear from them later today, and Hammersmith Academy, which we're delighted to have with us, which won this year's Sustainable School 2021 award. And we're delighted the summit will also close with the very talented students of the Brit School um, at the very end of the day. So please do come back for that. It's gonna be a very long day, but we will close with a fantastic musical performance at 6.15. And we're not working alone today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and we're delighted to be working with steering committee of fantastic individuals and school networks and organizations and to have more than two dozen partner organizations. We can't name them all, so please do, do look at our brochure and on the website for further details. Many of them are organizing events today, so please do check out the Deep Dives link on our website for a full list and register for their events. We're really grateful to them, one and all. And I'm gonna actually hand over to Marlene now, who's gonna talk through a few extra things. Yes, indeed. So you will know that um, this is a webinar, it's a Zoom webinar, and I just want to run through a few simple housekeeping um, rules for the day. Uh, so the first is that you've all been provided with one link that will enable you to come in and out of this day long session at your will. The program is up on our Twitter handle at climate underscore London, and it is also on the website londonsustainableschools.org. So please do check that out. It's the latest program and uh, the sessions are divided according to the five major themes, which are campus, curriculum, community, careers and finance. They will follow that order throughout the day. When you are in the Zoom webinar, please, we would like to have your uh, views, your opinions, the Q&A and the chat function are open. 
Um, what else do I need to remind you of? Um, I think that's about it in terms of the housekeeping. So um, we are a little bit early. Uh, we started exactly on time punctually. Um, so we may have a little bit more time to hear from our speakers. So let me hand back to Martin uh, to get the day going. So it's a real honour and a pleasure and a privilege to have our next guest and I'm really, really delighted. We've been working with the Mayor's Office for some time on various sustainability projects and it, to have um, the Mayor of London working with us on this special day on the Schools Climate Summit Day is brilliant. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, um, somebody that we're working in partnership with the Mayor of London and welcome Shirley Rodriguez to speak first. Welcome Shirley. Thank you Martin and to Marlene and hello everyone um, and I'm really delighted to be here opening today's London Climate Action Week 2021 Schools Climate Summit. It's a really important uh, opportunity to showcase the work that the education sector and schools across London are already doing to reduce carbon emissions and prepare for, respond to, and recover from the impacts of climate change. It's also an opportunity to identify what more can be done by the education sector, but of course, working in partnership with us, the mayor, and with other sectors as well to meet London's environmental goals. And of course, the climate emergency remains one of the biggest threats we face. Warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers are predicted too, with more intense rainfall, which will increase uh, the risk of both winter and summer flooding. Water scarcity poses an increasing risk in London and the southeast, um, both categorised as an area of uh, serious water stress. And we know that average temperatures around the world are already getting higher. And whilst not like the reports of extreme temperature uh, temperatures in the Pacific Northwest, you know, the heat dome, we're seeing average temperatures in London rise too. And this is going to have an impact on our critical infrastructure, such as our schools, but also on us and on, and, uh, on our health. There's really very strong evidence about the risks to health from excess heat, um, particularly for children. Public Health England estimated that there were 863 extra deaths during three heat, uh, heat wave periods that occurred in June and July of 2019. And almost a quarter of those or 200 of those deaths were in London alone. So in recognition of these impacts and the urgency of action needed, the mayor has set an ambitious goal for London to be carbon neutral by 2030. We are making progress towards this with, for example, using a pioneering zero carbon standard, which now all new buildings must meet, and a retrofit revolution to upgrade existing ones. We're tackling traffic emissions and pollutants um, through schemes such as the world's first 24 hour ultra low emission zone and other air quality policies. And these have seen a fall in the number of schools in illegal levels of air pollution by 97%. We're also making the city greener to help London adapt to the impacts of climate change and to support London's well-being. Since 2016, the mayor's funded the planting of, of over 340,000 trees, improved over 400 hectares of green space, and in 2019, London became the world's first national park city. But in this year of COP26, we must keep up the momentum on climate action to ensure governments across the world commit to ambitious emissions reduction targets and also help us in cities and the sectors, all of us who work here and live here, to help contribute to tackling climate change. And just as in London, we've adopted that ambitious net zero carbon target date of 2030, we urge other cities, businesses and governments around the world to match that ambition in a race to zero. We must do all we can to avert, minimise and address the loss and damage that is already occurring from climate change. But as we recover from COVID-19, we are putting, the tack uh, we're putting tackling the climate crisis at the centre of our recovery efforts. The Mayor co-chairs London, the London Recovery Board alongside London Councils. And we're all clear that London's recovery must be a green one, tackling social and economic inequalities alongside the environmental inequalities we've seen highlighted during the pandemic and lockdown. A key mission is to deliver a Green New Deal for London and this is aiming to double the size of London's green economy by 2030, supporting green jobs for all Londoners. And in doing so, we're tackling air pollution and the climate and ecological emergencies. The mayor's already committed the first 10 million pounds of his circa 50 million pound Green New Deal fund to projects, for example, like the Future Neighbourhoods 2030, which is um, trying to set up exemplar neighbourhoods, showing what a sustainable 
um, London could look like, um, and is targeting efforts in communities which are most climate vulnerable and most impacted by the pandemic. And of course, schools are a vital part of London's recovery, not just as individual beacons of excellence, but also as a sector. And over the mayor's first term, we built really strong partnerships with the education sector, schools and early years to improve London's air quality and to meet the challenges of climate change. Um, for example, the mayor's school and nursery air quality audit programmes addressed poor air, air quality in these settings. We've been supporting more than 50 schools to make their playgrounds greener through our Greener City Fund community grants. We've been helping install lots of solar panels and um, improve the energy efficiency of, um, of school buildings to cut carbon. And since 2016, over 200 schools have already signed up to have solar panels and other energy efficiency work through our, rare, uh, our, our retrofit accelerated programmes. We've already helped retrofit 70 schools um, and another 134 have already signed up this year alone. And I talk about these really just to show the great leadership by schools in earlier settings and what can be achieved working in partnership. Shirley's frozen. Organisations, funders, businesses, local people, and children and staff of the school. They also demonstrate the powerful role that pupils can play as ambassadors in improving London's air quality and tackling climate change. But we know there's more to do. We know how much climate change has the potential to disrupt our critical infrastructure, such as school buildings and the lives of pupils. In the summer of 2007, flooding in England resulted in widespread school closures that amounted to 400,000 lost pupil school days at an, at an estimated economic cost of £12 million, excluding damaged property. And during 2006, when temperatures reached a record high 36 degrees C in the UK, teachers have to send pupils home on health and safety grounds. So this is why uh, we produce guidance on how London schools and earlier settings can adapt to climate change to help schools prepare for, respond to, and recover from the impacts of climate change. And the GLA guidance is the first of its kind. We hope to see other cities follow in this footstep. But of course, this has to be financed. And it's right that the summit is looking at the question of how to pay for these initiatives, including retrofitting our school buildings. And I've mentioned on some recovery efforts um, and the negative impact it's had on school finances on top of the existing funding pressures you face um, and challenge school leaders. But last year, the government announced a 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution and a new 10 year school rebuilding programme. Since then, a new industrial decarbonisation strategy focusing on reducing emissions from schools and creating green jobs has been launched. The mayor will advocate for London's fair share of these new national initiatives. He wants to work with government to ensure these initiatives are successful. And we know that London can really provide leadership in this area. You've demonstrated that. So to this end, the summit falls at the start of a London's careful emergence of um, lockdown in a year of new national strategies and in the year of COP26. It couldn't be better timed. And I'm sure that the conversations and ideas that come from today will really address the huge challenges we face and recognise the opportunities that lie before us. And the Mayor and the GLA look forward to working with you all on these climate solutions. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Shirley. Marlene? Thank you so much, Shirley. Um, it's a pleasure to hear from you. Of course, we've worked closely together over the last few months in pulling together today's summit, and we're delighted to have your continuing support and leadership from City Hall. Um, you also touched on so many of the points on campus. You refer to schools as critical infrastructure. They are not referred to as critical infrastructure around the world. So I think London is leading on that agenda. For us as the organizers for today's summit, we're very keen to make sure that there is a balanced approach to the carbon emissions reduction, the mitigation agenda on which so many schools are working through the energy transition and solar programs, but balance that with the adaptation and the resilience agenda. This is crucial because the majority of schools face their principal climate risk through lack of adaptation to climate impacts already. So on that note, I'm going to invite our next speaker, Andreas Schleicher. Andreas, we're delighted to have you here from Paris. Um, Andreas is the, the head of the education directorate at the OECD, which is the <coughs> Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, Andreas is himself a leader in this uh, as a thought leader, 
as well as a practice leader on innovative education models. And we're delighted to have him present an international perspective on the challenges facing education and climate crisis. Over thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks so much for inviting me to the Climate Action Week. Uh, obviously, you know, climate change in education has been a long time on our agenda, uh, while today's climate agenda is still dominated by questions around technology, technological adaptation. It is very clear that as we move beyond, you know, 25, 30, uh, human change, behavioral change will become absolutely critical. And that will move the education agenda from somewhere in the margin to the absolute center. I think that's something that we can clearly well anticipate. Uh, we started with this work in 2006. Uh, we tried to, for the first time then, to assess students' knowledge around the science of climate change and uh, our global PISA assessments. And actually what we learned in those days, back in 2006, there were fewer than one in five 15 year olds in the industrialized world, in OECD countries, that could thoroughly explain environmental processes and uh, phenomena. It's quite startling, you know, that actually while awareness of the environmental issues was on climate was already quite high in those days, the actual knowledge of students uh, was actually quite poor about it. Uh, <coughs> we <coughs> found what's also interesting that students' awareness uh, went quite hand in hand with their skills in this area particularly when you talk about the science of climate change. So students who reported good familiarity with complex environmental phenomena, they also scored highest on the PISA test uh, on environmental uh, science. Now that's, I think, very interesting that uh, uh, knowledge and awareness are somehow linked. Of course, that doesn't prove that there's a cause and effect relationship uh, between them. Uh, but the fact that they are associated suggests that uh, curricular emphasis that is about why the environment matters, why the climate matters, and understanding the scientific phenomena behind it really is important to integrate this into a kind of conceptual model. But it also gets more interesting than that. You know, one of the most interesting findings was that students with poorer knowledge about climate issues they're often naively optimistic that all those issues will somehow go away. You know, the future will sort it out magically. There will be some politician who will, you know, have a trick to resolve all of these issues. There's nothing that I need to do. So very importantly, better knowledge, better scientific knowledge about the climate seem to enable students to more realistically assess, you know, the magnitude of the challenges ahead and therefore also be we willing to adapt their behavior, uh, looking forward into the future. So that's something I think very important. Uh, if we want young people to have a realistic appreciation of this agenda uh, and therefore to invest themselves in this, actually building uh, the foundations for this is, is very, very important. And that is not just about, you know, activism that involves deep knowledge and understanding of those issues. Uh, what was also very interesting for us is that you ask yourself, where do students actually know or learn about these issues? And you'll think, well, that's television, that's, you know, newspapers, all of those things. But actually, school was by far the number one place where students engaged with issues around the environment. Uh, was it a surprise to us? And, uh, but it's something I think we should take to heart that actually school does play a very important role in those kinds of things. Then, you know, that was where we started with this. We looked at those issues back in 2018, and uh, you could really see how awareness certainly has uh, been uh, risen to the forefront. Uh, climate knowledge, not always. Uh, we had 79% uh, of students across OECD countries that they say they knew very well about the topic of climate change, global warming. Uh, a lot of variability around this. Uh, the number one was Hong Kong with 90% of students, Singapore, and the lowest was Saudi Arabia, where it was just 40%. So you could see actually a lot of variability in uh, students' uh, awareness of issues around climate. Um, the 
Interesting students also feel a high degree of self-efficacy. That's also a really important dimension that can I do something? Uh, for example, 72% of students said they could easily or at least with some effort explain why some countries suffer more from climate change than others. So looking at the geographic dimension, the social dimension, 65% said they could discuss the consequences of economic development on the environment and uh, still two thirds said they could explain how carbon dioxide emissions do affect uh, global ch climate change, at least in a kind of rudimentary way, sort of looking at those kinds of correlations. Um, that is not surprising because when you ask schools, actually 88% of school principals in OECD countries said that climate change and uh, global warming are now part of the school curriculum. A very high percentage, think about it, you know, 88% in the OECD world. Um, and that, again, you know, there's variability in this, some countries uh, where this is everybody. The Nordic countries in Europe, for example, some countries where it's still a minority. But overall, you can see actually schools try to do a lot of this on the surface, at least. You know, now just emb embodying it that somewhere in the school curriculum doesn't mean that there's actual change on the ground. That's something very important. I'm going to come to that in a moment. Um, and that high level of uh, uh, school activity around climate. Uh, of course, should also be seen in the context of uh, how much this climate agenda matters to young people. What was very interesting for us to see is that this is an agenda that is important to young people, that is urgent to young people. 78% uh, you know, of students said that looking after the global environment is absolutely important to me. And in no country was that figure below 64%. That's also interesting. Even countries that may not yet see the direct consequences, you have always about, uh, you know, no more than a third of young people who are not seeing this as an urgent agenda. Uh, uh, of course, you know, that's easy to do. That's easy to say. The harder question is uh, how much do young people engage themselves personally? We studied uh, that as well. And you could see 71% say they reduce energy uh, consumption at home uh, by, for example, turning the heating or air conditioning down in order to protect the environment. You can see that's one personal consequences. 46% they read websites on social issues related to this. 45% say they choose certain products for environmental reasons, if, even if they are more expensive. So you can see that's where actually this personal sacrifice comes into play. I think it's a quite high number if you think about it. Uh, I'm not sure how well we adults would score on that. Uh, um, you also could see that uh, students participating in favor of, you know, uh, public campaigns on environmental protection, 39%, uh, boycotting products of companies uh, for uh, environmental reasons, 27%, and um, environmental or social petitions, uh, 25%. You can see actually there's a fair amount of activity around this, and um, <clears throat> you can see students are willing to make economic and social choices based on, on climate issues. But you know, let me add one more piece to the puzzle, and that will sort of put, you know, a salt of grain, uh, a grain of salt on all of this, and that is student agency. You know, the capacity of students to set their own goals, to reflect, to take responsibility for change. And uh, uh, this is where the big but comes. Now, when students were asked, you know, do you think you can do something about climate change? No? this very high figure of awareness dropped to around 57%. And when we asked them, you know, whether they think their behavior can impact people in other countries, the average dropped further to 44%. So you really see on the one hand, students feel this agenda is urgent. They try to do something in their own environment, but they have that sense, you know, what I do doesn't really, you know, impact on the climate agenda. And even, you know, among top performers, you know, I spoke very highly of countries like Korea and Singapore, they actually scored particularly low on that. You know, students are actually very good on the climate issues, but only 20% of students said that they are confident they can make a difference. And I believe really this is the area that schools needs to take on. I think we've done a lot on the awareness thing, we've done a lot on the self-efficacy thing, a lot on the scientific knowledge, but actually we have not given young people that sense of agency the sense that they can actually transform and do anything about this. No? And um, 
you know, school principals say, we have done this in the curriculum, it's all dealt with by students do not feeling that they can do about this. And I think that's for me, really uh, the big agenda ahead that we give young people that sense of empowerment. And that is not rocket science. You know, at the OECD, we studied some very good examples in schools around the world. And you can see actually in many education system schools are doing very well on this. They give students projects, they give them actually that sense where they can actually not just learn and absorb knowledge about it, but they can actually do things about it. And uh, we see there that if you encourage student agency, uh, you actually can uh, create that sense of ownership for this agenda and it's absolutely critical. Now we know that climate change is going to be the big test of humanity. I think this is now everybody aware and equipping young people with uh, knowledge is something key with the understanding of climate issues with a realistic appreciation of the magnitude of the agenda ahead. Now, this is probably one of the greatest investments that we can make in our people and in the future of, of the planet. Now, I know that some people say, well, you know, the education route takes far too long. Climate action is far too urgent. But, you know, we have been saying this since 20 years and we will not see real change in this until we see changes in people's behavior. And that is actually a matter of education and also what is very clear is that this is only best done early you know changing your behavior when you're you know 40 or 50 is really really hard on any front you know? changing your behavior in a young age is actually so much easier and uh, the understanding of the science of climate change i think is also very important we shouldn't underestimate this now the current pandemic has given all of us a sense of the powerful forces, you know, of, of Mother Nature and those who remained ignorant of science and, you know, gave precedence to comfortable beliefs, ideology or politics during the pandemic, they paid a very high price for this. And it's, that's exactly what we're going to see on the climate front as well. Now, you cannot uh, sweet talk uh, Mother Nature, you cannot spin her. Uh, Mother Nature will always do uh, what science, you know, says and uh, follow the principles of science. And um, so we better understand those kinds of issues. But uh, the use of science knowledge or science knowledge is only as useful as young people feel actually that student agency to, to act on this. And that's something where I believe, you know, we, we need to find new models of learning where students are not, you know, passive consumers of content, but they where they are actually active participants and where they can see the implications of their work. You know, in school, we do so many projects, so many things that then it disappear in the bin because they don't serve any social purpose. And I think this is something I, you know, encourage you to really look at uh, with, with, with rigor on this to ensure. And now, again, you know, there are many, many good examples. Now, this is why it is so important uh, to do that early on. And uh, of course, the students today are only a small part of our populations. But, you know, they will be 100% of our future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andreas. You've left us with um, a great deal to think about. Thank you for sharing uh, the results of your survey over several years. Um, do you have some time to stay with us to take some questions? I know, Shirley, that you have to leave. Thank you so much for your contributions. Just a reminder to everybody that today's summit is being recorded, so you will be able to catch everybody's speech um, from later on this week on our YouTube channel. So let's open it up to the questions that there may be uh, for Andreas. Please put your questions in the chat. Okay. So there Sorry. is appreciation for you in the in the chat for your words. If I may just pick up on something that you said, which is the challenge to connect awareness with agency. Um, the many examples that we're seeing of good practice in schools um, center around the empowerment agenda, empowering not only creating awareness, but creating a sense of purpose, agency, and empowering young people to act. Um, We'll hear about that from Let's Go Zero later on from many of our um, partners who are working within the schools context. Um, from your work across the OECD, which countries do you see as providing the best new models for engagement and empowerment of young people? I think, you know, they're very interesting models in uh, Denmark, in Sweden, Estonia, 
uh, and they actually not just through the climate agenda but they do have a very uh, very long history of uh, student agency of fostering student agency and for actually much of their curriculum is informed by students themselves students are very active participants not you know in the learning process but in the design of learning environments and i think this is very important in this context here yeah, I think as well, it's important when we have this discussion, we, we often talk about including young people, but it often tends to be the more able students. And I work at a special school and, you know, we, have as part of our summit, we've been thinking very carefully about how to engage those people in this debate that are often left out or often not normally engaged. And I think that's it to have such a, a big impact, we need to find ways of engaging all the, the, the young people in this debate as well, Andreas. I thought it was really wonderful to hear what you said, and very hopeful, but I would entirely agree with you that the, the big issue is to turn it from ideas into how um, practical action, um, young people can be engaged in practical ongoing action and feel that it's not something, like you say, that's thrown in the bin, but it has legacy. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that we, we've talked about a lot uh, in the run-up to this summit. So, yeah, it was lovely to, to hear that. You know, one area also that um, uh, it, it may not seem directly connected to climate, but is, is, is what we call global competency. The, mm. the, the understanding of interconnections, you know, if you drink a cup of coffee in London, do you understand the implications that could have for workers in Colombia and Brazil, you know, the environment there? And uh, often students lack that elementary, you know, knowledge of, 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 of connections that actually what they do shapes, you know, the behavior the imp has impact on others. Now, the uh, extent to which young people can, uh, you know, understand, uh, read different perspectives, uh, are comfortable in different traditions, different cultures and so on. I think this is another aspect that will be very important for, for this agenda. But, your point on inclusion, I think, is really important. You know, our education systems are always designed by people who are who succeeded in them, and actually, people who struggle uh, don't have much of a voice. And uh, in in this, you know, climate issue, you will need everyone. No, we mm. will need everyone. No. Yeah, I think another area as well is <laughs> Shirley talked about, which is the adaptation um, approach to climate action, and it. That is something that um, all students can engage in, how, looking at their own school campus, how can we adapt our school campus to make it more resilient? And, and that offers hope because whilst they may be struggling to make those connections across um, on the global context, they can see immediate benefit of, of adapting and making their school more climate resilient. So again, that's something that can be done as well. And the, if you've not had a chance to look at the mayor's um, report, it's a brilliant, their guidance document is a brilliant document, um, which we, we've received well here. So Andreas, people are asking where they can find the survey results um, and your other reports, presumably on the OECD.org website. Yeah, absolutely. It's the, the PISA study, the Program for International Student Assessment, and the climate issue was dealt with last as part of our global competency assessment. And then the first study, 2006, um, was called Green at 15, because we were looking at 15-year-olds. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Andrea. So we do have a number of questions which are also coming up in the Q&A. What I suggest is we power on through. Andreas, I know that you have to leave us now and we will move on to Jonathan's presentation and we will take um, the questions at the very end of the um, presentations of all of our four speakers. We have uh, 10 o'clock to 10.15, which is devoted just to engagement with all of our attendees. So please don't think that your questions will go unanswered. We will come back to them at 10 o'clock. Um, Jonathan, it's a pleasure to have you this morning with us. You don't really need an introduction. You and I have been working together for more than two decades, I think. Um, and you have been working on this agenda for a very long time, starting off, of course, as a teacher, but more recently with your publications and Reboot the Future. So I'd like to hand over to you now. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan. Malini, thank you very much and delighted to be part of such an important day. Um, I cannot imagine a more timely moment to have a summit of this kind during the London Climate Action Week and to remind us all exactly how important it is now that we move forward with many of these actions. And thanks to for Shirley and Andreas for their presentations before. Um, inevitably, 
well, I guess we're all thinking about where we are today in comparison to where we were back in 2019. It has been two momentous years in all, all sorts of ways. But for me, 2019 was quite astonishing, really, because of the eruption of new energy in the whole climate and ecological disaster space. And that came from Extinction Rebellion. But perhaps even more importantly for us today, it came from young people with uh, Strengths of Future, with the UK Student Climate Network, with a host of different organizations, all of which in 2019 succeeded in making politicians sit up and listen a lot more than they'd been doing before. And I really do want to give a shout out for that because 2020 was such a nightmare for many of those young climate activists. It was the contrast was cruel. 2019 ended with a real upbeat note, a declaration of the climate emergency, a recognition that politicians needed to do a great deal more, the acceptance of a need for a net zero target by 2050. It was really astonishing to think how much was achieved. And then 2020, the pandemic, and much of that energy was just uh, leaked away as a consequence of young people not being able to do as much as they'd done in 2019. And one gets a distinct sense now, of the pace picking up again, amongst young climate uh, activists, a realization that they can't in any way step away from the challenge that they accepted in 2019. And that that's gonna be a critical part of the rest of this year, 2021. And in some respects, depressingly for them, probably for the whole of the rest of their lives. And that's really an astonishing thing to, to think about. If you see it through the eyes of a young person today, to understand that the whole of the rest of your life is going to be shaped in some way or another by what is happening to the climate, by what is happening to our political response to the climate crisis that we face. So for me, that's a really uh, extraordinarily important reflection to put into the, into the picture here today. We're seeing this quickening of the pace of change in nature. I'm not going to go into that in any great detail Climate scientists will tell you personally how astonished they are at the way in which things are just moving so much faster than was once imagined. Even a few years ago, the pace of change today was unimaginable. Right now, it just moves from one bad scene to another bad scene. Now, to be fair, of course, we are seeing a quickening of the pulse in terms of the human response to that. And that's uh, really important. And we can draw a great deal of hope from that. But the last decade in that respect, from a national perspective here in the UK has been shocking, to be honest. I go back to 2010, when the incoming administration then simply swept away what was by then an already mature and sophisticated sustainable schools program in the UK schools, uh, set up before that by the Labour administration. And I know that as a, the former chair of the Sustainable Development Commission, worked very closely with Anne, Finlayson, who will be speaking later today as part of the uh, summit, and just watch Michael Gove sweep all that sustainable schools work aside of being completely irrelevant to this uh, government. And frankly, that set the pattern for the next decade, completely wasted decade in national political terms, a few belated things thrown into the pot at the end of last year, but still, in my opinion, uh, completely inadequate. But we heard from Shirley so powerfully that, that the mantle of leadership, if you like, in the vacuum set by Whitehall has moved to our cities and to schools all across the country. And it was really uplifting to hear from Shirley what's going on. And we know that our city mayors and other um, towns all around the country, rural schools could show a similar pattern of engagement and leadership, which I think is, is really important. The four C's that you've mentioned today as part of the, the, the framework, if you like, for the summit today, all of those four C's, whether you're talking about curriculum development or community, or whether you're talking about campus or career opportunities for young people, you can see terrific progress in all of those uh, different areas. So for me, that's really important. And it's been a delight for me personally to be a little bit involved in that through some of the work that I've been doing over the last year. Um, together with my colleagues in Forum for the Future and with a wonderful organization called Reboot the Future, where we had an opportunity to think carefully about 
how best we can help young people in schools today to frame their own sense of expectation and agency in uh, the years ahead. We were able to commission five short films, five five minute films, looking at this from the perspective of five very different young people, all sorts of different ways in which those young people can get involved, not necessarily as full on climate activists or campaigners, but through the things they learn about air pollution, about food, whatever it might be. And providing those materials, the films essentially are a book about where we can go between now and 2025 and a lot of materials for schools today, teaching materials to go with the five films. I hope that we've contributed something really significant to this change process that is going on in schools at the moment. And there are some astonishing um, initiatives going on uh, all around the place, as you know. I just want to add a little bit to that whole story about student agency, young people's agency in this whole area, because it is true that we need to look to young people to help that transformation process going on, uh, not just in schools, but in their families and with their peer group and so on and so forth. But let's not forget that associated with that practice is also the need for political engagement from young people. And that perhaps is a bit more sensitive, a bit more difficult. Some people feel a little bit more constrained about that. There isn't necessarily the same consensus that we should be encouraging with and working with young people to encourage them to flex their political muscles as they, as so many of them did in 2019. I was delighted to see, Malini, that at the end of this week, for instance, you're putting a lot of young people together with their MPs as part of the work that you've been doing with Globe International, uh, putting them in touch with their MPs so that they can bring that pressure to bear on them. We have to be supportive of young people becoming more and more outspoken in this whole area. As the betrayal of older generations deepens, we must expect that young people will become more and more outspoken. And if that makes us feel uncomfortable, good, frankly, because that betrayal is palpable. It goes on. And it's not just old campaigners who can tell the difference between the green flannel and rhetoric that we get so much of still from so many politicians who still think that they can get away with that kind of utterly vacuous response to what is actually happening in the world today. Young people see this and it's offensive. It's appalling to have to listen to that kind of political rhetoric. So part of our role today is going to be to find ways of continuing to work with young people to give them that authentic hope, none of the shiny optimism that you get from a lot of politicians that somehow technology will sort it out. Oh, it'll all be all right at the end of the day. It won't dispel the shiny optimism and encourage young people to have real authentic grounded hope in the opportunities that we still have to ensure that it is not too late to address these uh, twin emergencies. So we need to support young people in those initiatives, in those endeavors. And that's what I think agency means. It's not just agency to change how we live, it's agency to change the political system so that we narrow the gap between what science tells us and what the politicians are doing to respond to that science. I'll leave it there, Melanie and Martin. Thank you. The classic talk with the mute button on. Thank you, Jonathan. That was um, really brilliant, really inspiring, actually. I know the messages are, are serious, but still really inspiring. I sense um, optimism and hope in between the, the darkness there, Jonathan. Would you, would you say you feel that after working with the young people? It seems like the, I've seen, I think I've seen one of the films, and I, do, do you feel uh, hopeful after your recent work with them? I do, and, and it's hard not to not to feel that sense of hope because yeah. the determination and the courage and actually the imagination that so many young people have got today and they're putting into the mix is just brilliant. But Martin, part of the work I've been doing has also been to work with an organization thinking about young people's state of mind 
and yeah. some of the mental health issues today. And I, and I really appreciated the framing for the school summit today. A lot of sensitivity that you've shown in the materials that you produce for this. Sensitivity to young people's state of mind and those resilience challenges. We talked about adaptation. There's a lot, we need a lot of careful thinking about yeah. adaptation of the mind as well as adaptation yeah. of physical infrastructure. And that whole resilient side of things for young people is going to be an equally important part of it. I don't, that's not to put a downer on it, but- No, no, I agree. And we have to temper the hope we have with the recognition of what this feels like as a young person. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. I think oh, it's, it's, it's kind of you to say that as well, but we, we feel that, um, I mean, I, I guess it's my natural approach being a teacher and I know you are too, Jonathan, but you, you can't go too doom and gloomy into working with kids. It just won't work. And I think um, you can't also, like, as you say, be helped to be inspired by young people's enthusiasm. But I liked the term, I think you said sort of realistic optimism or something along those lines that you said. I think that's right. I think um, that's why I like the adaptation strategy. That's why I like the concept of showing what you can do in your own school, but then showing how they're part of a sector of a move that this phrase that Marlon he coined about thinking as a system and acting as a sector. And I think um, yeah. all these things kind of show young people that there are possibilities out there. And also the thing Andreas said about work, thinking that the impacts we have, which I think sometimes we, we do just think, oh, it's a cheesy thing to say, but something that we just reminding young people actions they have here do have an impact or on elsewhere and it isn't just a thing that we say um but 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 my making connection so my school is linking with a, a children's center in peru and that simple one-to-one -one often works mm. better than talking about that the, the whole world but yeah no it's wonderful jonathan thank you very much marlene did you want to say anything else before i introduce the next guest um, Jonathan, you're having an impact as always, as you do. We've got some really positive feedback in the um, in the chat. Um, I do want to, however, um, pick up on one thing. We have, of course, had a lot of support from a politician, and that's Stephen Twigg. Mm. And you mentioned, of course, the very the great innovation that there was on the sustainability agenda in the early 2000s. Yeah, we had an institutional response which placed sustainable development and education at the centre of government policy. We had the Sustainable Development Commission, we had the Sustainable Schools Mandate, and here in London, we had this amazing thing called the London Challenge. Yeah. The London Challenge was started by people like Stephen Twiggs. Stephen was the MP at the time, he was the, um, uh, the Minister for Schools, and the London Challenge addressed the profound inequity in schooling performance between children from working class communities in the inner city schools in London and the rest of the, the rest of the city. And the London challenge saw to it that we managed to, within a matter of years, raise the educational attainment of an entire generation of poorly served young people in inner city London. It was remarkable and it sets a model for the country and a model for the world. So my personal ambition and my inspiration has been the London challenge. It shows that where there's a will, you can, there's a way and you can have impact at scale. Now, Stephen has been a great supporter of our efforts. He's one of those politicians who doesn't just uh, talk the talk, he walks the talk. Yeah. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us today. Um, he's now the new head of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, so a great colleague of mine in terms of the parliamentary, the legislative work. Um, but he is on his first ever trip to Jersey to meet with, Parliament to meet with our colleagues there. He has, however, um, left us um, with a very thoughtful message, which I just like to share with everybody. Um, Stephen says, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to send a message of support to today's Schools Climate Summit. The summit is a timely and important opportunity as the world prepares for COP26. At the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, we have recently launched our new strategic plan, which has six key cross-cutting themes, all of which resonate with today's discussions around gender, youth, disability, sustainable development, and climate change, small states and jurisdictions, technology and innovation. I know from my previous experience here in the UK how important it is to enable all sections of the community to have their voices heard if we are to make progress on the sustainable development goals adopted in 2015. When I was a minister, I helped to establish the London Challenge, which worked with schools, local authorities, and others 
to improve education across London. As we seek to challenge, as we, excuse me, as we seek to tackle climate change, there are some positive lessons from the London Challenge and the ongoing excellent work done by today's schools in London, including three key ingredients for success. Firstly, the importance of working collaboratively so that we learn from each other. Secondly, the importance of cross-party political support for this work. Thirdly, the importance of the education system engaging with the wider community. Today's summit has all three of these ingredients. I wish you well for a successful day. And on that note of cross-party support, I'm very pleased that we have Neil Carmichael, who was the former MP and chair of the Select Committee on Education, who will be joining us to close the summit at the end of the day. But I'm now going to hand back to Martin to introduce our fantastic next speaker. Brilliant, thanks Marlene. You know, it's great to hear that from Stephen Twig as well. Lovely message there. So I'm delighted now to introduce Sharon Johnson. And Sharon, apologies if I don't get your title right, but um, you are the, I think you are the Director of Strategic Communications and Engagement of Global Optimism, which sounds just like the best title ever, if you can remember it. So uh, I'm delighted to hand over to you, Sharon, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to just apologize for being a bit hoarse today. It's a, a, a function of the season and tree pollen and all sorts of things. So um, thank you very much, Marlene and Martin, um, for organizing this incredibly important conversation. Um, I work for um, an organization called Global Optimism, which was founded by Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnak when they left the UN having secured the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And the reason we call ourselves Global Optimism is not um, a Pollyanna-ish uh, ideal view. It's because we wanted to put our shoulders to the wheel and work with people like yourselves, like the educators, like the Jonathan Porritts, who, who has joined us in a few conversations in the past to um, manifest the goals of the Paris Agreement. And that's really the, the, the topic I'd like to talk to a little bit today. This is without doubt the most decisive decade in human history. And I have no doubt you have heard that already today and we'll hear that many more times today. This is the nine years in which science demands that we halve global greenhouse gas emissions in order to be on track for preventing the worst impacts of the climate crisis. This is not the job of national politics alone. It will require a profound rewiring of the global economy all the way down to local economies. It changes how we get our food. It changes how we transport ourselves. It changes how we secure our energy. It changes every job that our children who are currently in education will have. It changes absolutely everything. But the good news is that it is all in our hands and it presents a brilliant opportunity for systemic responses. And all of that allows the schools of today to become the most relevant institutions for and with young people. We aren't delivering education to them as parents, as educators, as administrators. We have to embrace education for a resilient future with our children. Already, we are witnessing the shocks associated with the locked in 1.1 degrees of global warming in the form of harsher storms, more frequent flooding, longer fire seasons in many parts of the world. In the UK and in London, our financial beating heart, we see the consequences every single day of a changing climate and its sister issues, inequality, negative health outcomes due to air pollution, more deeply damaging um, consequences are the one that I think Jonathan raised a few moments ago, and it is our biggest challenge, and that is the challenge of despair. The reality is that within the time frame of their time in education, every young person 
in the hands of the school system right now will be learning what part they can play in tackling the climate crisis. And from where we sit, we see that the UK government has amongst the strongest commitments in the world to reduce our national emissions and play our part as a country. But that will remain largely empty unless everyone understands their agency and the part that they can play. So it is now the turn of those of you on this call or who may view this subsequently to take your agency very, very seriously. You who run, influence and shape the education system have an enormous role to play. Climate change pervades every part of our society and our economy already. That is not going to change. But what has to change is this sense that we're absolved of personal responsibility. We have to encourage every student, teacher, administrator, and parent to take a deep breath and decide to play their part because we still can, because we are the first generation that has the tools, the technologies, and the resources to do this. And because your students, our children, will spend their whole adult lives tackling the consequences of climate change. This can't be done in a geography lesson any more than tackling the social ravages of apartheid was a history lesson when I grew up in Johannesburg during the worst horrors of a regime that denied people their humanity on the basis of race. So if you work in education, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher or an administrator, you actually hold the crucible of not just the long far off future, but the very near term future in your hands. And our children, whatever ages they are, are not blind to what really matters. They may not all be willing to carry a placard or vigorously campaign as the young people who have just been so important to the narrative have been able to do, but everyone can campaign for a safer future through the work that they will do. And it's our responsibility to do not only what we can, but what science says is necessary. And that means shaping our societies to look climate change in the eye and decide what we each can do to build a better future, a bustling economy, a thriving society, and allow our children to play the key role that they can and they must. So it's up to us to raise them and educate them to understand their role, to learn what we can do now, and to learn what they can take forward. And this provides a crucible of hope. And from hope springs ingenuity, imagination, action, and ultimately, that is the bedrock of social prosperity and personal satisfaction for them in their lives as they grow up and as they become adults. So in the same way as the school system didn't decide to build computer literacy um, in an ICT class, it's a far greater function um, than the geography class um, to, to sort of build a system around tackling the climate crisis in a way that children and young people can delight in the opportunities that the challenges afford them. So your role, the role of the summit can't possibly be to find a quick fix. It has to be a series of decisions to take the future forward. It's about what schools do in their operations as much as it is about how we approach a changing climate, adapting to what's already locked in and our responsibility for tackling its impacts at a really systemic level. So if this is the most decisive decade, then, then you in education are in fact perhaps some of the most decisive actors. There is every possibility if we do what's necessary in the 2020s of achieving a better economy, a healthier society and happier and more resilient adults in the future. And our children are not only 
a recipient, they are very much the key. They will be the food technicians, the local authority employees and employers, the business leaders, the lawmakers, the financiers of the 2030s and the 2040s. That is not far away. So their sense of agency now is what will shape their worldview as much as their skills will, which makes our job and your job to ensure that they have the grit and determination to manifest not just an adequate society, but a thriving one. And that to Jonathan's point is not about some sense of Pollyanna-ish optimism. It's what we call stubborn optimism at our organization. And we're finding that that notion is quite catchy. So throughout history, change has come about starting with a few. Our role now is to accelerate the role of young people writ large, and we can, and they will, but we have to take it through the system. And so um, I would like to encourage a, a much wider debate on how we don't just inform and educate, but also empower young people to have a say in their schools, in their local communities, and to engage beyond collecting pollution. Um, so thank you very much for having me and um, look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Sharon. That was very powerful, um, especially because I called on you to step in at such short notice. So I'm very personally grateful. Um, and to yourself and <clears throat> Tom and Christiana's work on establishing global optimism and pushing a fiercely optimistic agenda to counter the intense anger and sense of betrayal and despair that there is out there. Um, I also want to recognize the work that you have done over the years with the elders and for Nelson Mandela's centenary where you worked with young people around the world. And of course it was Mandela who said, um, if you use education, it's the most powerful weapon for making change. So we know that we are trying to engage across the school system to engage everybody because everybody is complicit in this. Um, we have a number of fantastic questions and comments in the chat and the Q&A. So without further ado, um, if we can kick off on that, um, I think Jonathan, the first one is really for you. And that is about the central government's response to this agenda. So where are the examples of strong central government leadership? I think I know where there is. I think it used to be in the, the mid-2000s. Um, you have a personal recollection of that. Perhaps, perhaps you, know, you can draw on the example that we had in the UK, but you'll know of many others around the world where central governments are actually providing leadership on the Education for Sustainable Development agenda. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to dwell too much on, on the UK history here because it is a a sad and completely unnecessary one. It was a straight ideological decision that this was not what schools should necessarily be doing at that time in the year uh, 2010. And we've paid a heavy price for that. But throughout that time, when the Sustainable Development Commission was working very closely with the Department for Education and Science, we were looking all around the world to see where examples of good practice were emerging. So where governments were enabling things. I mean, Obviously, this isn't a, a central government department making the stuff happen, but enabling and allowing uh, municipalities, local authorities, cities, and then the schools themselves to actually bring forward very proactive, dynamic uh, school interventions. One of the countries we looked at was South Korea, which has got a, a fantastic track record of bringing forward um, really good educational initiatives, not just around climate, but around the whole um, ecological uh, disaster as well, biodiversity and so on. And, and I suspect, Malini, that if people were interested, that dossier of success, as you might call it, would give a great deal of inspiration. Now, let's hope, and you two are closer to this than I am now, let's hope this government actually does at last understand the initiative or the opportunity now to bring schools back into the frame as critical players in this uh, key ambition level. We have such an ambition ambition for the UK. I mean, we're brilliant at setting targets, as you know, 
we are world beaters in target setting. No country can touch us for target setting. Mm -hmm. But once having set a target like that, you have to say, okay, now we are going to turn to education, not just as a sector, but as your, your introductory comments said, Malini, we need to look at this systematically as a system shift that has to happen in the schools as much as anywhere else. I think on Jonathan as well, I, I don't think we're not trying to forget about the, the 2010 situation either. We, we very much want to um, learn from that. And, you know, the, in 2010, you'll know this yourself, Ofsted were writing reports, um, schools were engaging, head teachers were really beginning to engage. And I think it is a, a shame and a crime that it was stopped. But but the reality is also we are where we are. But we we very Marlene and I very much don't want to forget those lessons and the things yeah. that people learned at the time as well. So um, <clears throat> whilst we are in this new situation, we we are we try to look back at all the, the great sustainable schools work that was set up. And like you say, Anne Finlayson. Um, a legend really from that time and she's speaking today and has kept the, the flame going um, across the UK so I think uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's a difficult one and we, you know we, we also like we said earlier we do want it to be cross-party and we, we're very much about engaging people in this and, and it's not about guilt or recriminations but it's also not about forgetting and trying to build on, yeah. on what we've learned. Um, Marlene, do you want to do the next question? So, um, again, for, for Jonathan. Jonathan, there's a question about the dossier that you just mentioned, um, where that might be available of um, uh, good practice around the world. Um, is this a, would it be on the archived website of the STC, Sustainable Development Commission? I doubt oh. it. I doubt it. I think you probably need to address that question to Anne. To Anne Finlayson, is this who, the sustainable school stuff, Marlon? Sorry, I missed the. No, no, it's it's something different. But we can. Okay, sorry. So just yeah. a reminder to everybody, because there have been some very specific questions about issues around um, the most impactful carbon reduction programs um, yeah. and uh, and uh, campus adaptation, and of course we have two whole sessions. Um, on campus in which you'll be hearing from experts like Charles Pike from Hounslow Council, who has been working with uh, as a local authority energy manager with schools precisely to address the most egregious emissions sources in schools, which my understanding are actually kitchens, um, and how to engage uh, students and, um, and faculty in um, in addressing those in a collective manner we've got of course Anne Finlayson for the session on curriculum we've got Jim Knight we've got many many others um, but in terms of the 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 questions directed towards you um, I think it's once again it's to draw out on what gives you hope so there's been you know Jonathan you spoke about how the surge in student activism from 2018 onwards was a huge motivator. It brought hope to so many of us who've been in, in the environment movement almost in its death throes <laughs> in the 20, 20, you know, in the, the, the last 10 years. Um, but if you can expand a little bit more on that. And Sharon, if you can draw on your experience as a campaigner and a communicator on this in the last few minutes that we have. I'm still persuaded that the conventional routes to pressuring politicians to do more than they might be doing at any one time are important. I don't doubt that. We still need to carry on with all the same amount of lobbying and persuasion efforts and building coalitions because the one thing that politicians do respond to is when they get the sense that this is a, a, a coalition of interests, not just a special bit of, of narrow minded interest coming from one group or another. So all of that stuff still counts. But for me, it's the additionality that's going to really matter. Where is the additional pressure going to come from? And I was very struck in 2019 by how that engagement with young people kind of changed the dynamic. There was one amazing moment where um, Greta Thunberg was here in the UK at the invitation of Caroline Lucas, our wonderful Green Party MP, and she summoned a lot of, well, invited, sorry, a lot of MPs to come along and listen to Greta Thunberg. And there was one brilliant visual moment where you've got Michael Gove squatting like a naughty schoolboy looking up somehow at Greta Thunberg, who, as you know, is diminutive in stature, not diminutive in global stature, of course, but physically. And there was Michael Gove looking up at her, sort of, and he felt, okay, what is going through your mind now? As you are basically being 
told what the reality is of your dereliction of duty and and the political system's dereliction of duty so i become totally persuaded that young people's contribution to an an additional authority giving permission to adults to do what they should be doing is an absolutely critical element in the total mix i really do i mean there are many many other elements voice of business voice of spiritual and religious leaders all the rest of it all of which can make us authentically hopeful but that voice from young people i think has a distinctiveness that is very special brilliant sharon do you want to add to that yeah. so i mean i agree and and who could not agree that uh, you know the young people um that have stepped up into their activism feel that they've been propelled into that by a, a, the, the inaction of what they're seeing around them. Um, so they're not in, inured to the science and the facts. They are demanding action because then by the time they're able um, to lead the companies and the governments, it will be too late. And that is our responsibility. We can do what they're asking for. But I would suggest that we need to do more than just that. Um, I would suggest that for every young person who can find it in themselves to carry a placard in the streets, there are thousands more who may not self-identify with that mode of action that feel exactly the same thing and would benefit from a level of engagement in their daily lives that in allows them to express their agency in practical terms. Um, so, and, and I think that's the whole premise of, of this summit is climate change is an everyone everywhere problem. And the solutions have to belong to all of us in order for them to be viable. Um, so therein lies the amazing opportunity um, of building an entire society of stubbornly optimistic people who know what to do and will put their shoulders to the wheel to do it and understand that we all benefit um, when one of us does. So. Brilliant, thanks Sharon. Sharon, can I come back at that um, on two things? As a, as a geography teacher, um, I, I was really, uh, I really liked what you said about from the geography perspective and I know um, Steve Brace, a colleague from the Royal Geographical Society, is speaking later in the curriculum session too. And he, we both would agree entirely. And I think there are some amazing geography teachers engaging in the debate. But recently I've worked with um, some musicians called Studio 2909, who've done the most wonderful work with uh, young people in um, schools in East London and in Westminster to engage them through music into air quality. And it's absolutely brilliant when you listen to them and, and they deliberately targeted young people who weren't actually normally engaged in this debate, yet their response was breathtaking really and I think that just speaks whenever I try and imagine what a music teacher might do or what the caretaker might do or etc cetera, etc cetera, it's never as good as the what the person themselves would do and I think that's why you need to get everybody involved because the the benefits of people's own authentic action with once in, without wanting to use jargon is so much more powerful um, Marlene yeah I mean there's not much more to add to that I think um, <clears throat> entirely agree with uh, both feeling so much more hopeful because of the surge of the activists as well as the surge of the aware because of course not all young people are activists none of my three children would count themselves as climate activists so I've obviously failed in my parenting. <laughs> it's a reminder, it is a reminder that it, it, it takes all sorts and that we have to make um, it possible for all sorts to want to care about this agenda and want to address the climate emergency and the crisis 
of biodiversity. Um, and that takes education. So we're back to that golden thread, which is the importance of education, the importance of bringing in also other voices from outside. So what Martin said about Studio 2909 is a wonderful example of the many that we're showcasing today, where you've got parents and carers and community workers and faith groups who are all working within the school's community. So this is not just about teachers. Magnificent though they are, um, present company included, it's not just about students and young people, it's about the role of the energy manager, the business manager, the school governor. We're delighted that we've got the chair of the National Governors Association, for example. Um, but we have a wonderful array of voices. Um, it's very important, of course, to mention that we have young people themselves who are speaking today. They'll be sharing their experiences through the videos that they have produced for their schools. Um, they will be here joining us from Teach the Future to talk about the work that they are doing, the advocacy that they are leading as student-led organizations. So unfortunately, we have to bring this session to a close. Um, I want to thank both of you who are still with us, Jonathan and Sharon, um, for all that you do, for being stubborn optimists, um, to Andreas and to Shirley, um, who were there earlier, and to Stephen, who is there with us in spirit um, and more power to our elbows. So let's continue to work together on this. We have a fantastically energizing mission ahead. So um, I will close today's session, um, this morning session rather, and invite you all to join the next one, which is at 10.30 today. We're taking a 15 minute break to get teas and coffees. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you to the campus session. So once again, my thanks to all the speakers, uh, my co-chair Martin, and to all of the attendees, please come back for more at 10.30. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.